we should have asked Mark on the show uh, years ago, and, and I guarantee you we will ask him on again uh, now that we've actually lured him into our lair. Uh, but the thing that prompted me to want to get in touch uh, currently is Mark is the author of perhaps the greatest legal brief ever written. <laughs> Um, and it's it's just been filed. It's in advance of a hearing that will take place next week uh, in the Central District of California in a case involving, uh, I think it's Paramount Studios and CBS. Uh, is that right, Mark? Uh, I, as far as I know, it's only Paramount, but I, I'm not really paying attention to the main case. I'm only paying yeah. attention to my one minor uh, issue in it. But, right. Um, Yes, but Paramount is uh, is definitely the plaintiff in this case up against a, uh, a a movie company that is trying to make a piece of fan fiction uh, about you know, a, I guess a prequel to the entire Star Trek universe uh, of of films. Yes, and and uh, it is uh, called Axanar. We have a clip here called Prelude to Axanar. This is a um, it wants to be a crowd funded. Uh, fan film based in the Star Trek universe, starring Richard Hatch, among others, who uh, folks will remember if they were Battlestar Galactica fans in the 70s uh, and various other things that Richard Hatch did. Um, and, and it just looks wonderful. We'll let you uh, watch a bit of it here. The that the humans could lead the formation of the Federation just a few years after their war with the Romulan Empire is nothing short of extraordinary but it represents something very different to the Klingon Empire. Growing tired of diplomacy, their High Chancellor proclaims, if words were water, the humans would drown us all. <laughs> the bad blood between the humans and the Klingons meant that the job of preventing war and leading the peace delegations fell to Vulcan. Regrettably, we failed. Uh, watch the rest of this wonderful prelude to Axanar uh, on your own time after the show. Um, it does. I'm I'm dying to see it. I hope they get it made. Uh, but there is a fly in that ointment, and that is the fact uh, that the um, rights holders, Paramount here, are claiming uh, that the entire endeavor violates various copyrights that they own. Um, they've procedurally, they're at the very beginning of their lawsuit. A complaint was filed. Uh, a motion to dismiss that complaint had some success uh, in saying that it was um, too general. So a first amended complaint has been filed where some of the specific copyright violations were uh, delineated in more detail. Things like the pointy ears of the Vulcan, uh, are claimed to be under copyright. Uh, things like gold shirts and the insignia on the um, shirts themselves are claimed to be in copyright. Uh, another thing that is claimed to be under Paramount's copyright is the films. Again, the film hasn't been made yet. They do, They have a script, they're trying to get funding, and they have this uh, wonderful trailer that they've done. Um, so you, you can intuit some things about what will be in the film. And one of the things that Paramount has intuited is that they intend to use snippets of the Klingon language in the film. And here is where Mark and his client come in. Uh, Mark, tell us who your client is. Well, they are a group of, uh, of people who are into creating languages, uh, which I, I did not even know was a thing until they, they approached me, which I found just fascinating, uh, you know, that there, there is an entire society of people who are, are into this, uh, into this art. Um, and I would say that, you know, Klingon is probably, you know, at least arguably uh, the granddaddy of all these creative languages. I, th I think there's a, there's a good argument that Esperanto would be more so, but, you know, Esperanto being uh, so old and nobody really trying to claim ownership over that. In fact, the, the inventor of Esperanto immediately dedicated it to the public just in case there was ever any argument. But yeah, my client is the Language Creation Society, and you can find their website at conlang, C-O-N-L-A-N-G dot org. Um, just fascinating. I mean, I, I, I would say go to the website or don't go to the website if you have something to do because I found myself <laughs> just sucked into a, a hole hours and hours long because there's just so much fascinating stuff on it. I mean, this is a, 
the, I sent them actually, you know, the, these guys, I sent them an email this morning, both thanking them and, uh, and in part cursing them for, uh, for how much time they had taken from me. Um, <laughs> right. We also have so, uh, so Klingon is just right one now. of one of the languages that they are concerned with is what you're telling us. Yes. I mean, there are people yes. here, people in this organization who have uh, created languages that have one speaker. So mm -hmm. th this is, uh, you know, Kling Klingon is sort of the success story of a, of a modern conlang. Right. You, you cite the Big Bang Theory at one point in your brief because there's an episode where Klingon is used and you're, you're demonstrating very well throughout your brief that Klingon has taken on a life of its own beyond Star Trek. It's yeah. related uh, to Star Trek, but beyond the episodes in which it is spoken. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it may have started that way, but mm -hmm. there are people who, there are friends who only communicate with each other in Klingon. You know, that's their only common language. And I don't care where it started. You know, the, the neat thing about this is there is no analogy uh, mm -hmm. at all. Uh, there, there's never been an analogous case. Uh, I could see... I can see Paramount's thought here that you know, we commissioned its creation, so we own it. But uh, I think it's just a little bit too much mission creep in copyright law, uh, which mm -hmm. I think has probably gone a little too far as it is. Uh, I've, I've, I do an awful lot of copyright enforcement, but I, I'd say that the, a lot of those cases are that's uh, you know, I'm doing my job, not uh, not doing the Lord's work. Uh, but I'd say is if I could rewrite copyright law, it would be a hell of a lot shorter and a hell of a lot thinner. Um, and I think that this would be the first time that somebody really – I mean, I know the Tolkien estate tried to claim copyright over, so over its elvish languages. But this is really the first time this has ever come to a head. Uh, and right. I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I'd have a real problem with that if it, if it was successful. So tell folks, and you very eloquently do it in the brief, and I encourage everyone to read the brief because it is just a joy to read from start to finish. It, it includes uh, many phrases in Klingon that help uh, make the point quite graphically that the language is um, a viable, creative, expressive uh, form that's out there. Uh, can I just comment too? I haven't seen any of the coverage on your brief uh, marvel at the fonts that you use, both <laughs> for was, the English hmm. text <laughs> and where did you ever find a font for Klingon? I guess it just makes your point. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it, it, it actually, uh, someone at my, in my staff installed it and that was like <laughs> right up until the moment we filed it. I was just raging around the office saying, can we get the damn Klingon font? We need that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't think we... I don't think we necessarily legally needed it, but it, it really helps prove the point. You know, I, 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 I needed to, I felt like if the judge is going to consider this, which is you know, not a fait accompli, but if the judge considers this, and even if the judge doesn't, you know, I wanted to make sure that the conversation was clearly focused on the fact that this is not a gimmick. You know, this is not just somebody coming in with some bizarre notion. Although, it, and, and funny enough, to put the creativity into using the Klingon language, I, I, think, I think it would have seemed more like a stunt without it. Um, mm -hmm. with, you know, with it, you really do show that this is, this is not just a matter of, uh, you know, of, of making the argument for argument's sake. Uh, right. If you control a language, no matter where that language originated, but you control a language, you control an entire mode of thought. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you are, are multilingual, but, um, you know, I, I am. And, and there are thoughts that I have, uh, you know, there are times when I have to take a thought that originally, you know, percolates out of the source code in my brain in Italian. And I have mm -hmm. to, in my head, translate it into English, even though Italian is not my first language. Um, there are just some thoughts that work better that way. Uh, there are some things that just don't translate. There's all those websites you, you can find where there are like 50 phrases that are just beautiful in some languages that have absolutely no meaning in English. Like the, you know, the, I'm sure there's a German phrase for, you know, the, the, the joy of seeing someone else suffering while they uh, are wearing lederhosen and, and eating uh, French fries. You know, there, there, there's just a, <laughs> there, there's just a, there's, you know, the, there's a there's like a French term for you know feeling homesick for a place you've never been before. I don't know what it is, but 
And in and in Klingon, the fun thing is it does shape the way you have to think about things. Because I was looking for how the heck do you say intellectual property law in Klingon when <laughs> there is no word for intellectual. <laughs> this, would, this would be a very weak trait to have as a Klingon. Um, so <laughs> you need to look at it. And what I came up with, uh, I was immediately, like within hours of the brief uh, circulating, immediately scolded and berated for my awful Klingon and, and saying that this is not how you would say it. And the, and the person was, uh, you know, I would not say unhinged about it. They were exact. <laughs> I think they were absolutely right. And I just, I looked at it and somebody else read it and said, you know, what a jerk. And I said, no, no, what a jerk. That guy's awesome. This is the most fantastic thing that could possibly have happened because right. it's showing if you can argue about how to actually grammatically express something in a language, then that sh I think that proves uh, right there that it is not something subject to possession or ownership or control.